And I unloaded the whole, the whole wagon load of hay on her. Went, <laughs> just, and uh, I even recorded it, and I know the message that it was. I don't remember a lot of messages. Huh? I remember it. I remember it. It was one called Cosmos. Yeah, I was preaching this back about 10 years ago. That's about when it was. And we just... On, on Sunday nights, we are in a study of uh, what the, uh, uh, of the Jew. We've gone through two views of the Jew, and we've been on a particular uh, view that has been espoused by certain peoples in the United States. We've talked about the spiritual Jew, spiritual Jew, and of course that's the Jew of the heart, and that's what the Jew is now. That's what we believe here at Grace and Truth Ministries. In the Old Testament, they had a temple. Over here, they have a temple in the New Testament, and the temple of God now. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Over here in the Old Testament, they had circumcision of the flesh, circumcision, and then now our hearts are circumcised, our hearts and ears, hearts and ears are circumcised over here in the New Testament. Uh, over here in the Old Testament, uh, you had priests, priests, and of course the priests were Levites, and, the, and they had kings over here, and the kings come out of the tribe of Judah, and of course these two were the two anointed ones that stood beside two anointed, and now, and of course they both were anointed with olive oil, olive oil, and so you got priests and kings anointed with olive oil. Over here you've got priests and kings, the Bible says God hath made us priests and kings, priests and kings, and we're anointed, we're anointed, and that's not with a Pentecostal anointing like, like Kenneth Copeland talks about and those guys. We're anointed with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is truth. That's our anointing. And over here you had Israel, literal Israel, little Israel, and of course Israel was called kingdom, kingdom of God and the rabbis dropped the word God and inserted the word heaven they said they would bring reproach upon that name if they continue to use it that's why the Jews today write G-D well they put kingdom of heaven and of course we have kingdom of God kingdom of heaven over here and now Jesus said the kingdom of God kingdom of God is in you. So the kingdom is in us because Christ is in us. And they said wherever the king was, the kingdom was consummate. And over here, you've got the candlesticks. You've got literal candlesticks. And, and uh, then over, that's in the Old Testament. That was literal. That was the menorah. And over here, you've got candlesticks. The candlesticks. And the candlesticks now of course, the word is menorah, it's lamps. The only reason it was translated candlesticks was during the King James reign. They used candlesticks as a method of lighting in the streets and in the homes. And over here, that's the seven churches, churches or churches of Asia, or it is seven is the number of refinements. So it's the refined, it's a picture of the refined church as it goes through the fiery trials of life. And you've got the table of showbread over here in the Old Testament table of showbread and Israel was called uh, Israel was called a barley barley loaf you remember when Gideon uh, was going to attack the Midianites uh, he was told by the Lord to get up on a high mountain and and shout the sword of the Lord and Gideon and blow trumpets and break these lamps and shout the sword of the Lord and, and Gideon and it was said in the scriptures that a barley loaf came rolling down upon the Midianites. Well, you've got bread over here in the New Testament. The Bible says concerning the church, we being many are one bread and one body. So that's the church or the body of Christ or the wife of Christ. 
everything that you've got on one side, and we could go on and on and on. Everything that you've got one, you've got on the other. Well, that's the spiritual Jew over here now. That's what it is. And I said this before, the law is still here. The law is here. When people say the law is done away with, that's really strange. How in the world could the law be done away with? Was the bread a part of the law? And we being many are one bread. Was the candlesticks a part of the law? Well, yeah, it was a part of the law. Uh, was, the, uh, was the kingdom of God, was that in the law? That was Israel. What about priests and kings? He's made us priests and kings. What about circumcision? Was that in the law? Was the temple in the law? The law is still here. Jesus said, one jot or one tittle will not pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So the law is still, still here. That's the problem. People think they don't have to abide by any law. As soon as you say, obey God, everybody starts saying, legalism, legalism. You bet your life. God is legal. And he says, if you're not obedient to me, I'll beat your brains out if you belong to me, and I'll make you obey me. So, well, certainly there's a law. And that's the spiritual Jew when the Bible says a Jew is not outwardly, but a Jew of the heart. Let me show you a couple of things on this. I've got to show you this. Look over here. In Romans 2, we're still in, in the Anglo-Israel, but there's some things I haven't brought out uh, to you on this. Look over here. In, go over here to Romans, the second chapter. Now, people say the law's done away with. The, spiritual, the whole point is the spiritual Jew is here. Look here in Romans Romans, the second chapter, 12th verse. Now, if Romans, is Romans in the New Testament? Uh, uh, I think so. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. I think that's the New Testament. Well, what's so amazing is Paul talks about the law all the way through this book of Romans, and the law is still here, Romans 2 and verse 12. For as many as have sinned without the law shall perish without the law, and as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Verse 13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law. You think this is a different law? The doers of the law shall be justified. The law is still here. All the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. And love is not having affection towards them, that word love is agape, and agape, that has to do with a relationship with a man had for his children when he would leave his business to them. He gave them laws to live by, and they would willingly walk in them, and it's also the relationship that a father, that a king had for his subjects. Now, look over here in Romans 3.27. Look at Romans 3.27. Romans 3 and verse 27 where is boasting then? Is it excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. The law is still here. And guess what? The law of faith has always been here because faith is death to self. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen in substance is hypostasis. From hypo, we get the word hypo, hypodermic, under the dermis, under the skin. Hypo means under, stasis means to stand, and from stasis we get staros, staros, and that is the word cross. And so this means under or through a continual cross. It also means understanding, but the Bible says none understands. And Jesus said, if you don't bear your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Disciple is the word mathetes or learner. If you don't learn, you can't understand. Cross and hypostasis, understanding, go together. It takes a cross to understand. So, the law of faith. You have to die to self to understand this law in the New Testament. Well, guess what? You had to die to self to understand the law in the Old Testament. Not only is the law of faith here now, but the law of faith has always been here. That was the law of faith in the Old Testament. And look over here in, in Romans 3, and look at 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. He's not saying the law is done away with. He's saying the deeds of the law are the ritual of the law. We said this morning, Colossians 2.14, that the ritual was blotted out, not the law itself. Now look over here in Romans 3 and verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? 
I like this verse. Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. Boy, that's good, isn't it? it? Here's Paul in the book of Romans in the New Testament saying, when we have faith in God, we establish the law. The law is here. It has not been done away with. Uh, and it never has been done away with, and it will not be done away with. I'm going to go into some more of the law, but I simply brought that out to show. I brought it out before, but I wanted you to see that we still have the same law. We're still under that. The only true Jew is the spiritual Jew. Those people over in Israel are not going to go to heaven when they die because they can claim some background and say, my great-great-grandfather lived in Russia and we can trace our generations back for all these years. The only way you're going to go to heaven when you die is by being a spiritual Jew. And Paul says in that second chapter of, of Romans that a man is not a Jew outwardly, but of the heart. Circumcision is of the heart. You know, I was, I've talked to some of you along the way, and people say, I can't understand how this is all going on. Do I have to be making some effort to be sure that I understand all these things, what I can make sure they're going on in my heart. You can't make sure of anything. You don't have to understand these words and these words. What you do have to understand is that God is causing this to go on in you if it's going on. Understanding is good. It makes life easier to live as a believer. But it doesn't mean you have to understand it in order for it to be going on. You can be the simplest person out here, a very simple person, a very common person, a person that doesn't have a, an extended education. And these are the things, the pointing I'm getting at, these are the things that God is doing as his elect family. Now, what we're talking about, we're talking about, uh, we talked about a, a second uh, picture of the Jew, which was the dispensation. here dispensation and dispensationalists believe that the jew is of the old testament and of the old testament and during a time period that they call the new testament church they say that's completely separated from israel how can it be separated from israel when we're talking about all of this this jewish terminology it's not separated from israel this is a time period of the gentiles when they will be God's Israel and they'll be circumcised of the heart. Well, they say that Old Testament is all, of course, is, is all Jews or Israelites and that the New Testament is nothing but this is a period where uh, the New Testament church was, has nothing to do with Israel. That's what the dispensationalists say. It has nothing to do with Israel. It's not Israel. Then they say the last seven years has to do with literal Israel that's why we have to be taken out at a pre-trib rapture. But there is no pre-trib rapture. We're going to be changed at the last trump. And at the end of time, there's going to be seven trumpets that sound. And after the tribulation of those days, the Lord will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet in Matthew 24. Well, I'm not going to go through that again. What we're talking about is something that, that men have come up with, and it's permeating the church quite a bit, and that is the Anglo Anglo-Israel, Israel view of the Jew, not of the Jew, excuse me. They say the Jew is an evil person. They say Anglo-Israel. They say that, that they are Israel and that these people in Israel now are evil people and that only white Anglo-Saxon Americans and British people comprise this Jewish nation. And what this is, this is what you would call the Aryan movement. It was been, it's been called Aryan movement for thousands of years. A-R-Y-N, excuse me. Aryan. O-I-N. A-N, excuse me. This is the Aryan movement. This is that the Teutonic tribes of the, of the North, uh, Northern Europe, the Scandinavians in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, area, these tall, blonde, blue-eyed, square-jawed, handsome Caucasians that these are supposed to be 
the Jew of the, this is the true Israelite is what they call it. Excuse me. I keep saying Jew. They say the Jew is something evil. Well, of course, this Aryan doctrine has become, it has infiltrated the church and has become to call, be called Christian, Christian identity. And when you find CI uh, that's related, that when you go into the Internet or you go into books and you see CI related to Christianity, it's talking about that. Christian identity is talking about neo-Nazis, neo-Nazis. And the reason they call it Christian identity is because they've got a cross associated with it. They have churches. They have their Bibles. If you go to a compound of the KKK, that's one of the people in this. If you go to a compound, they're going to read their Bible. They're going to burn a cross and say, down with all inferior races. We need a white America. That's what they're going to say. And they're going to have their Bibles, and they're going to be reading from the Bible. And they're going to get in their pulpits and read from the Bible. And most people do not know where the Klan gets their doctrine. They get it from that and where the Christian identity people get it. Now, a lot of the Christian identity people come the same way Baptists come, the same way Church of Christ come. You got many different facets and many different offshoots, but they all go back to the same doctrine. Some of them are violent. Some of them say they're not violent, but they're all preaching the same doctrine, which leans towards, it leans towards a violence. And what they're doing is they're saying that they're the true Jew. That's what the KK believes. That's what the neo-Nazis believe. Uh, and that's what you've got when you've got the skinheads. Skinheads, these are guys that shave their heads and, and they go to these compounds and you have all these militias, militias. And when you get into a lot of the, what's going on in the militia, there's a lot of militia activity all over America. You've got it in Kentucky. You've got it in Tennessee. You've got it in Texas. You've got the big... Uh, Montana militia, that's where the Ruby Ridge ha incident happened. And uh, then Timothy McVeigh was, was connected with the militia. And all of it, now they may all have a different approach to it, but if you're preaching that uh, white Anglo-Saxon America is Israel, you're preaching the same doctrine that Timothy McVeigh was teaching, and he went out and blew up that federal building out in Oklahoma City, and this man was a maniac. Now, you know what? He thought he was really, he believed that he was doing something right because some preacher got a hold of him and told him Christian identity was okay, that we're Israel of all this filth in America. First of all, God did not tell us to go out here and to get into a fight with people. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. He doesn't tell us to blow up people or to put a million rounds of ammunition together like, like uh, David Koresh had, or to, to take God's people and put them on a boat and take them off to South America to a place like Jonestown and feed them all uh, lemonade and uh, 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 applesauce and uh, whatever. God didn't tell us to do that. These Christian identity people, they are these, they are these people here that it's the old Aryan white supremacy belief and they believe that they were supposed to be, for some reason, they think tall, white, tall, white, blue-eyed uh, makes for more righteousness. I never met anybody tall, white, and blue-eyed and real handsome that acted real righteous to me. And uh, besides that, like I said, Adolf Hitler wasn't, and he wasn't blue-eyed and he wasn't blonde. I don't know what he was doing trying to purify the human race. If he's going to purify the human race, first thing he needs to do is side. Uh, to get rid of some of the imperfection in the human race. Well, these people have got, they have got all kinds of leaders, and a lot of people don't know these, who these leaders are. I was reading out some of the names, and Gerald said, he said, I had no idea that some of these people that he had listened to were involved in this over the years. And uh, you've got many people involved in it, and they have a doctrine, and uh, some of the leaders... Some of the leaders are Dave Barley. He's uh, part of it. Lewis Beam. He's a former Texas Klan leader. Richard Butler. He's 80 years old. He is a patriarch of the Aryan Nations and uh, uh, has a nationwide organization in uh, Hayden Lake, Idaho. 
where this guy Butler lives. He's hosted many of the radical right's most dangerous criminals. Born in Denver, he was a World War II flight engineer. What's really amazing, a lot of these guys are retired Army, Air Force generals, colonels. They're not stupid men, and they're organizing things this way. He was later met two of the primary creators of Christian identity, California racist William Potter Gale and Wesley Swift after the 1970 death of Swift, who had formed the nation's first identity congregation, or the Church of Jesus Christ Christian. That's what they call it, this, uh, this certain parts of these groups. That's why they call it Christian identity. It's actually, needless to say, a mixed religion. Butler started his own hardline identity church by the same name in Hyde, Idaho. Butler, who was acquitted of federal sedition charges in 1988, has reached out to make sectors of the extreme right. In addition to his annual Aryan Nations World Congress, he has held special events aimed at recruiting racist skinheads. His compound has been the springboard uh, for convicted terrorists at least as far back as early 1980s. Now, a lot of people that are Christians will get involved in this, and they don't know what they're getting involved in. We've had some people leave here get involved in this, and you don't know what you're getting involved in. Get away from it. Then you've got Paul Hall, who edits and publishes the nation's leading Christian identity publication, the Jubilee. And these guys get involved in every kind of uh, gross activity. In addition to Identity Fair, the bi-monthly tabloid features conspiracy-minded stories on events and politics around the world. The paper of Paul Hall has used reporters such uh, as, has used as reporters such leading lights of movement of former Texas Klansman Lewis Beam who covered parts of the 1993 siege of the Davidian compound near Waco, Texas. And this goes on and on. And they've got uh, uh, Richard Hoskins, who's a former member of the American Nazi Party. This is what you're getting involved in when you get into the idea. It's nothing but pride makes a man think that he is, uh, that he is a uh, su supreme above somebody else. The Bible says all have sinned come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. The Bible says that, that there's none righteous, not one, that there's none understands, none seeks after God. And Job said all men are worms. Job said all black men, all white men, all red men, all yellow men, all brown men are worms. That's what he said. You can't raise yourself up and say, look at me. <coughs> I'm a proud worm, and I'm prouder than this other guy. Robert Miller had an armed compound outside Mulder, Oklahoma, and he has what they call Elohim City. Let me read this to you. It's very interesting. This is part of the Christian identity movement. Robert Miller's armed compound outside Mulder, Oklahoma, I remember Oklahoma's where Timothy McVeigh blew up the uh, federal building, has been, a, has been a meeting place for many of the more sinister figures of the extremist right. Among these linked to Elohim city, Elohim is the word God in the Hebrew. Among those linked to Elohim city are Timothy McVeigh, who called their minutes after renting his rider truck. He was in contact with Christian identity. Recently convicted members of the Aryan Republican Army, Mark Thomas, the identity preacher who pleaded guilty last year in the ARA's conspiracy to rob banks, and James Ellison, leader of the violent Arkansas group that planned, among other things, to poison water supplies of major cities. Miller, a 72-year-old identity preacher, was born in Canada and raised a Mennonite. How's that? A real peaceful Mennonite. And decided to become a member of the identity group and start killing people in the name of Jesus and saying, I'm an Israelite and I'm better than you. Um, I mean, you don't go out shooting somebody because uh, you're better. I think, isn't this amazing? Let's just say blacks and yellows and reds, let's just say, just for the sake of argument, that they're less in, in, in tel, intellect than the white Caucasian. Let's just say that just for the sake of discussion. Uh, does that mean, what did Paul say in the, 12, in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians that we're supposed to do with the uncomely parts of the body of Christ that don't fit? Well, that guy is uh, retarded. What we're supposed to do is kill him. Uh, he's less than me. No! We're supposed to lift them up if they're less. We're to give more honor to the uncomely parts of the body of Christ. 
But I don't believe that about black people. Let me tell you what. Reggie Jackson has an IQ of 165. He could have been a neurosurgeon, a heart surgeon, a scientist. A man with that kind of IQ could have been anything he wanted to be, but he wanted to be a ball player. Madonna has like 150 IQ. She could have done whatever she wanted to do. And guess what? Jane Mansfield had an IQ of about 150. She could have done anything she wanted to do. So it doesn't have anything to do with whether you're white or whether you're black. Nothing to do with that. People say, why does so many young men end up in the black community out here in prison over the whites? Well, first of all, they're, they're oppressed, never given any chance, never given any opportunity, and they fight, try to fight their way out of the ghetto. They fight the system. You can go down here. You can go down here in Bordeaux. You can look at the streets. They don't repair them like they do in the rest of the city. If you think they repair them like they do out in Bellevue, you're really mistaken. I was down there with a fellow one time, and we went in to get a candy bar, and we got some chocolate, and was in Bordeaux, and he, he opened it up, and it was all white. It turned white, and he said, this is where they come and dump the leftover candy. They come down here and dump it on the poor and say, we can sell it to him, them. They can't complain. We won't do nothing about it if they're going to get candy from us. And that's what goes on in America. This Robert Miller says that he had... He had an apocalyptic vision in 1948 before making his way to the remote compound where officials say paramilitary training takes place. Miller was pastor to white supremacist executed on the same day as the Oklahoma City bombing for the murder of a police officer. The man is buried at Elohim City. There's one other guy I want to read it to you because he is their spiritual leader. His name is Pete Peters. In a world aging identity ministers, many of them out of touch with modern audiences. Peter J. Pete Peters is a rising star. He seasons his extremist views with humor, and in so doing, and that's what Jesse the plant, the guy with the IQ of a plant does down there in New Orleans. That's what Bob Harrington did, and they did nothing but do a takeoff on Brother Dave Gardner, who was a religious comedian nightclubs in the 50s and 60s. That's all it is. He seasons his extremist views, this is Pete Peters, with humor and in so doing is managing to reach millions using the internet, shortwave radio, and the offices of his Scriptures for America ministry based in his Laporte, Colorado Church of Christ. Now, Pete Peters believes in water baptism for salvation and crackers and grape juice for salvation and the other points of the Church of Christ. You have to do those things in order to be saved. Peters was... Organizer of 1992 Estes Park, Colorado, gathering of 160 Christian men that brought together radical right factions and set the course for much of the current anti-government movement. While he portrays himself as a relative moderate, Peter's racism is apparent in his past rhetoric. Now, he is their theologian. When they need advice, when they gather together, when some of the Aryan races and some of the uh, skinheads and some of the clan get together, they'll call him for their theology. But he is continuing to reach out to others. Identity expert James Aho of Idaho State University says Peters 51 wants a coalition with non-identity extremists. He realizes this is giving him a bad rep, so he wants to start hooking up with some other people. As a result, Aho says, Peters and his soft version of identity together form probably the most viable identity movement in America. What they're saying is he can convince more people because he's got a softer word with it. He's speaking good words and fair speeches. Now, we're, this is something that's going on in the church today, and people are making this appeal. Now, don't think that I am, don't think because Pete Peters will say that Christmas is pagan and that Easter's pagan, that me and him preach the thing, same thing. Don't you believe that? Because Pete Peters is a church of Christ, and he believes in water re baptismal regeneration, believing in watered regeneration for salvation. All church of Christ in America know that Christmas is paganism. That's why they do Christmas in their homes and not in their churches, because they say it is pagan. That's every church of Christ in America knows the truth about Christmas and Ishtar. For those of you that's been in Church of Christ, you know that. Now, we're talking about these people 
Where did they get this doctrine? Where did they come up with this? They got what they, they come up with their doctrine out of the Bible. It comes from Old Testament. The reason most people can't deal with, uh, with these uh, identity people, which the Klan has been around a long time, uh, most, the reason most people can't deal with them is they don't know where they got this. They got it out of the Old Testament, and what they're doing is twisting the Bible. They got some of it out of the New Testament. They get out of, uh, out of 2 Corinthians. In fact, look over here back in 2 Corinthians. Here is where the Klan, Adolf Hitler, the Christian identity people, boy, the Pete Peters are one of the violent members. What I'm saying is a man who speaks soft like Pete Peters is more dangerous... He's leading people off into more false doctrine. And you can hear Pete Peters on the, on the radio. He broadcasts around the country. He's got, it as, got his own radio station. You can hear him on various, quote, Christian stations. And these people, where they had to get their doctrine from somewhere. They got it out of the Bible is where they got it. But what they did was twist the Scriptures. Look over here. And people wonder, what are the clan doing with crosses, burning crosses? Why is it they're reading Bible and quoting from the Bible? They are Christian identity, or they, they are CI, as it's called. Look over here. Here's some of the doctrines that they use. Look over here in 2 Corinthians 6. Go to 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and we'll read some of these things. We're talking about this. This and you know what? This is not any different than what the Baptists do when they come up and twist the doctrines about predestination and about uh, the sovereignty of God. It's not any different than what they're doing. It, what is this all about? It's about the great apostasy that's going on in America. Look at 2 Corinthians 6. What they've got. I've got a paper here. I've got a paper that is... When I'm reading this... This come off the internet, and this is their Kingdom Identity Minister's Doctrinal Statement of Beliefs. I'm going through this. This is a statement of belief by the Christian identity people to tell you where they get their doctrines. This is where their doctrines come from. Look here in, in 2 Corinthians 6. Go to 6. This is in the Christian identity uh, rules and laws, their statement of faith, their statement of belief. This is what they preach in their churches. This is what they preach when they get together at their rallies and burn a cross and say white, uh, white superiority, long live the white race. This is what they preach. It, I'm, while I'm preaching up here, I, I can picture some of these people taking a little clip out of one of my clip out of one of my messages saying long live the white race uh, I do not believe what these people believe let me make this clear I'm trying to clear up and let people know where the Klan gets their doctrine from and how polluted the church is when you go down south there's a lot of people in the Klan my grandfather was a member of the Klan and he thought it was a good thing he was ignorant he didn't know nothing about anything uh, when it comes to these kind of things. Look here in 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17. And they will say this applies to them. Now, before I get into this, let me just say one more time. Where this started from, they call themselves the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what these CI people call themselves. And they go through the 10th chapter of Matthew in the 10th chapter of Matthew, where Jesus brings all of his apostles together, and he says, go not in the way of the Gentiles. Don't preach to the Gentiles, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What they are saying, they're saying that northern Israel, when it was carried into captivity in 722-21 B.C., that northern Israel, the 10 northern tribes, were carried up into northern Mesopotamia, that's up there in the, what we call today Russia. Here's Georgia, Armenia. And they were carried up here, and they migrated across, that they migrated across 
what we call modern day Europe and that they settled in Great Britain and they, where they get their king, this is what they say is going to happen. They say that Zedekiah, Zedekiah was the last, Zedekiah was the last king of Israel while Israel, while Israel was a nation, Zedekiah was the king. Well, Zedekiah is carried off, his eyes were put out, and Nebuchadnezzar comes in and sends the, his commander, Nebuchadnezzar, in to blind Zedekiah, the last king, and then carry him over into Babylon, into Babylon. And of course, he kills his two sons before his eyes. Well, when he kills his two sons, the CI people, the Christian identity people, say the two daughters, the two daughters... <laughs> Now, this is very important. We went through this, but they say the two daughters of Zedekiah got with Jeremiah. Since Jeremiah did not go up to Babylon and he stayed in Israel when they're carried into captivity, that Jeremiah got the two daughters of Zedekiah and they went on a journey and went over here to Great Britain and that they took the throne through the two daughters of Zedekiah to Great Britain. There's only one thing wrong with that. God never, ever, 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 let me emphasize that, ever passed the throne through daughters. Never. You understand that? Besides that, Jehoiakim, the brother, excuse me, the nephew, Jehoiakim, the nephew of Zedekiah, the son of his brother who was king before him, Jehoiakim was king before Zedekiah, and he was carried off into captivity. There were three deportations from Israel. There was one in 605, excuse me, in Judah. This is when Nebuchadnezzar came in and carried Judah away. There was one in 605, one in 587, 80, excuse me, 597. One in 597, 96, because it's in that area. Well, during the 597, 96, this is in all probability when Jehoiakim was carried away. And then in 586, there was an utter annihilation of Israel. And this is the one where Zedekiah was carried away. Well, of course, Zedekiah's sons were killed before his eyes, and he has no seed to carry on the throne and the crown of Israel. But after they get into captivity, Jehoiakim is raised up out of prison by the king of Babylon, and he's given a spot, and he was the original king before Zedekiah. And we find that Jehoiakim, under the word, under the name, J-E-C-H-O-N-I-A-S, Jeconias is found in Matthew, the first chapter as the one that the seed is carried through, not through Zedekiah, when the king raises up, Jeconias is just a contracted form of Jehoiakim. So this destroys their king theory. And when you destroy the king theory, you destroy the theory. You know what amazes me? They just looked there in the end of Jeremiah and in the 24th and 25th chapter of 2 Kings, and presumed that the throne went through Zedekiah without reading real close in the last chapter of Jeremiah. They didn't bother to look and see who did the kingly line go through in Matthew, the first chapter. He didn't go, they didn't go and see that. So the seed did not come through Zedekiah. It went through Jehoiakim, who was king before Zedekiah. So once you destroy that, you've messed up their world. And what they say is they ended up in Great Britain with a, with a king from the lineage of Judah, and that's not true because God never passed it through daughters. Never. He pulled some real tricky things when we were studying the kings of Israel, didn't he? To get it to go through the right kings. You remember Joash? They thought they'd killed... Who was it that killed... Uh, who was it that killed all the sons? She thought she'd killed all of her grandsons. Athaliah. 
Well, she thought she'd kill all of her grandsons except one, and God retained that one. His name was Joash, and he was hidden away by the high priest of Israel. And when he grew to an age where he could take over the kingdom, he brought him out and said, here's the king. It always went through a male, never the females. Always. You remember when Judah, how that in the 31st chapter of Genesis, how that he didn't turn his son over to uh, to Tamar, how that uh, he turned one son over, and Onan took the place of Er, E-R, and Onan let his seed spill on the ground, and God got so angry because a surviving brother was supposed to raise up seed to his brother, and Onan said, if I'm having sons, I want to be mine, not my brothers. So God killed him, and so, so uh, Tamar said, what am I going to do? And Judah evidently got discouraged and thought, well, let's forget it. And he went off on his way. And she played the harlot and put a veil over her face and, and went into Judah. And that just shows you how here's the, here's the father of the, of the kingly race, Judah, and he's out there going into a harlot. It shows you just how weak men are. This is the fourth son of Jacob. Well, when she went into him, she became pregnant and when they got back to their, very, their various cities and camps, Judah said, she's going to have to die. Who did this? And she said, whoever this bracelet belongs to, I think that's yours, father-in-law. Look at the trick. Look at what God did to make it go through the sons, not through the daughters. So whenever the CI, the Christian identity set, went to Zedekiah's daughters, that's his, that flies in the face of truth as much as anything else. Because God never let it go through daughters. Don't you believe that? Now, so they said that they had to keep their race pure. They're saying over the last 2,000 years that northern Israel, northern Israel, northern Israel, that's, this, that's white Anglo-Saxons. That's the stupidest thing I have ever heard in my life. How in the world you can come up with that being white Anglo-Saxons? That's like, they, first of all, when they were carried off up here into Russia, do you think they kept do you think they kept their identity up here when they didn't keep it down here in Old Testament? They intermarried all the time down here when they were coming being carried off into captivity and coming back. Northern Israel intermarried all the time. Do you think they cared about intermarriage? They never cared about that. I'm going to tell you what happened to Israel when they were carried into captivity by the Assyrian kings, they ended up here. The reason there's so many Jews coming back to Israel during these last days is because this is where they were carried, up here into Russia. It says USSR. That's an old map. But what happened to them? I'm going to tell you what happened. They were carried off up here, and very few of them kept any ethnic identity. They intermarried like crazy. You've still got some of them that considered themselves Jews, but there's probably a tremendous mixture. People start arguing about what color Jesus was and the Jews were. I don't believe in 2,000 years we can understand what color they were. First of all, it doesn't matter what color they were. When Paul says in Colossians, the third chapter, that in Christ Jesus there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. Circumcision was a title for all of Israel, not just northern Israel and southern Judah. These Christian identity people say that southern Judah is Jews, that only people from Judah are Jews, and that Jews are evil, and people from northern Israel are righteous, and they're all white Anglo-Saxons. Is that dumb? That's just stupid doctrine. And what they do is take these verses to prove it. I don't know how they prove that they're, Jew, they're Israelites, much less prove these verses. When you look here in verse, look in verse 17, this is in there, this is in this right here, in this identity profile. It's in their, it's their uh, statement of faith, their statement of beliefs. These are the verses they use, all these people use. When you look here in verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and that's touching lesser races, they say, and I will receive you. 
This is a priest's words. Don't come in contact with uncleanness. He's talking to the church. It's not white Anglo-Saxons. It is black, white, red, yellow, brown, and it's all of the colors of the world. It is God's elect people. He's saying, stay away from men who live in their sin. In the context, if you'll notice, verse 17 has to do with verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's not saying be not unequally yoked with another race, is it? It's saying be not unequally yoked with unbelievers, those who don't believe God. We're to fellowship in truth. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? He's saying don't be unequally yoked with unrighteousness. And they pull out a verse and say, see, come out and be separate and be a white race, you stupid people. It, I can read this and just get, you know what makes me angry? They take my God's word just like a bunch of Baptists and twist it. Some of them are Baptists if you get down in deep Mississippi, Louisiana. Yeah. And what communion hath light with darkness? That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about intermarrying races. He's talking about intermarrying truth with a lie. And what concord has Christ with Belial. They, see, they pull that one verse out and say, come out and be separate. Be a white separate race. That don't even make sense, does it? And what part hath thee that believeth with an infidel? He's saying, don't, don't fellowship with infidels. It's what he's saying. And what agreement hath the temple of God, which is believers, with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He's not talking about white Anglo-Saxon Americans. He's talking about all believers. <coughs> Is that idiocy? Look at Revelation 18. Here's what they say. 18. This is the next verse in their list of verses. They take the Bible and pervert it. Well, at least it's obvious that they're perverting it. When these churches talk about accept Christ, they're perverting it too because there's no accept Christ. And here's the next verse in their list of verses. Here in verse 4, chapter 18 of Revelation, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Come out of what? Come out of Babylon from the previous chapter. But that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth in verse 18 She's the mother of harlots in verse 5 of the previous chapter. She was built in Genesis 11, 4, upon let us make us a name. It's saying come out of Babylon, and these are the same words that God gave to literal Israel in Zechariah, the second chapter. I her my people, that you be not partaker of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. How do you partake in somebody's sins? You accept their doctrine, the Bible says, in, in 2 John 10, if anyone comes preaching another doctrine, don't bid them God's speed and don't receive them into your house. Because whoever does bid them God's speed, which is the word caro, C-H-A-I-R-O, that means to be cheerful. Whoever is cheerful to another doctrine is partaker of their evil deeds. In verse 11 of 2 John. Well, this is one of their verses. This is not talking about separate races. It's talking about separate belief from unbelief. That's also what was said over in Zechariah, the second chapter. Look at it. Zechariah, he's not talking about come out and be a separate race. Just, that just really, be, it just galls me. Just, I get in Zechariah 2, that, that Zechariah, was in 520. He started preaching 520. Northern Israel was carried away in 722, 21. So Zechariah's message is not to northern Israel. It's to southern Judah that these CI people, these Christian identity people, say are evil people. His message was to them come on out of Babylon. That's what he's saying is come out of these unbelievers. O Zion, 
that dwelleth with the daughter of Babylon. Come out of Babylon. You've been over there since 586. Here it is, 520 B.C., and it's time to come out and build the house of God. That's what he's talking about. Let's go to another verse. Look over. Here's their next verse, Jeremiah 51. What they're doing is polluting the Word of God. Jeremiah 51, 51, this is their statement of beliefs. Jeremiah 51 is about the destruction of literal Babylon. 51 in verse 6. Flee out of the midst of Babylon. This is talking about the Jews. Those of Judah, not even Israelites. I'm sure there were some mixed in with them. But he said, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto Babylon a recompense. How in the world do they come up with this, that this has to do with white people? This has to do with Israel in old ancient Babylon. Isn't it crazy? And then they... Then their next verse is over here in Exodus 33. Exodus 33. This is in their statement of beliefs. Who is Exodus written to? <laughs> what does Exodus mean? It means when Israel, after they've been in Egypt for 400 years, they're coming out as one nation, all the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes as one nation. They haven't even split yet. They're one nation. It doesn't make sense, their doctrines. 33, Exodus 33. Exodus 33 and verse 16. They're using this to twist, and they're saying this is talking about white Anglo-Saxons. How in the world could Exodus 33 be talking about white Anglo-Saxon Caucasians? <laughs> it's about Israel. All 12 of the sons that made up the entire nation. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? I think the New Testament, that is spiritual Israel or believers. They're saying all white Anglo-Saxons have got some inheritance with God, including all of the axe murderers, all of the serial killers, John Dillinger, pretty boy Floyd, that they are, <laughs> Clyde Barron and Bonnie Parker are spiritual Israel. Dumb, because they were white Caucasians. I wonder where they went when they died. You think maybe hell? They said, we're in hell. We get to rule hell. We're Israelites. Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated. White separatists. This ain't white. This is Israel, you knucklehead. I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. See, white Anglo-Saxons need to be separated from all the people on the face of the earth. You dumbbells. This is Israel he's talking to. Exodus is about the exodus from Egypt where they've been 400 years. They are the sons of Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. Not and the angel said to Jacob, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called Caucasian. from henceforth. And this is where the Klan gets their doctrine. Is this dumb? Uh, they're stupid people. How in the world? How can a human being believe this stuff? Look over here. Here's their next verse. Leviticus 20. Go to Leviticus 20. Who is Leviticus written to? I think the word Leviticus comes from Levi. I think that's pretty Jewish, isn't it? If you find some guy named Levy, Levy, he's uh, supposed to be from the tribe of Levi. And they're going to kill anybody named Levy if they need to. Right? Just, God, deliver us from these people. What foolishness. Leviticus 20, Leviticus 20, 20, in verse 24. 24. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. They say this is the United States of America. What? Uh, 
I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. This is nearly comical reading the Bible the way they've applied it. A land flowing with milk and honey, they're saying that's the U.S. That is the land of Canaan that God gave to their father Abraham. It's this right here. It's not the United States of America. And, of course, when Pete Peters writes Jerusalem, here's how he writes Jerusalem. I've got to put it up here. Now, here's what he says. He says, this is Jerusalem. J-E-R-U-S-A-L-E-M. USA in great big... I really think, if I was thinking like him, let me see. I think S-A-L-E-M. I think it's Salem, Massachusetts. Don't you? I mean, is that stupid? This is the kind of reasoning you get from a four-year-old who's trying to get profound. That's what it is. And it, if anywhere it says separated, they say, that's us. He's not talking to Caucasians here. He's talking to Israelites. Can you believe that somebody will be stupid enough to believe this? God, you know what? These guys ought to get them some tall yellow hats with little red balls on them, get some great big yellow shoes and a big fluffy uniform with a, with a red polka dots on it and go to work for Ringling Brothers Circus because they are clowns. Yeah. But here's, here's their next verse. Look at Deuteronomy 17. Huh? Well, they go into it and they get into all of it, but you, we can sit all day long and talk about it. Look at Deuteronomy 17. This is, this is in their rules of order. Okay, this is their statement of faith. Deuteronomy 17 and verse 15. Well, 14 and 15. When thou art come into the land, Deuteronomy means second law, comes from duo, meaning two, or duet, meaning second nomos law. This is that just before Israel crosses the Jordan River, and it has nothing to do with Anglo-Saxons. Anglo-Saxons during this day, during this day and time, they had a name. They were called Assyrians. They were called barbarians and butchers, not Israelites. Verse 14, and then read 15. When thou art come into the land, the land that was given to Abraham, this is about 1400 B.C., the land was given to Abraham around 2000 B.C., about 600 years before this. When you come back to the land that was given to Abraham, your father Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, Jacob's name being changed to Israel, not when you come to the United States of America. When you come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and thou shalt, shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me like as all the nations that are about me. <laughs> Look at 28, 13. This is their next verse in their doctrines, 28, 13. We really need to just go through these and see. We know what this is about. This is the law. It's the law given to Israel on Mount Sinai through the hand of Moses. Was Moses a Jew? Well, I guess he was. This was written by the hand of Moses, except for the last few chapters because it talks about Moses dying. I don't think he could write that part. Deuteronomy 28, verse 13. Here's the next verse. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and, shalt be above, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if thou shalt hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and do them. And it's because the United States is the head and going around, and they're the most powerful nation in the world, and everybody else is the tail. So therefore, they're saying that uh, this is white Anglo-Saxons. This is stupid. 
That's just dumb doctrine because you look at the first verse of this. This was written to Israel. Here's what gets me. If you look over here in the previous chapter, in, in chapter 27, verse 11, and Moses charged the people the same day saying, Who you, what people do you think he's charging? Israel. He's their leader. These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when they are come over Jordan, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, Benjamin. And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak. This is all the tribes of Israel, not Caucasians. But you know what? Nobody ever wants to deal with these people. And when he tells all these Israelites in verse 1 of chapter 28, it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And then he goes on to say, I bless you in the city, in the field. When you go in, when you come out, and you'll go against your enemy one way, and they'll flee seven ways. He's talking to Israel, not Caucasian Americans. And he's not talking to Assyrians, which is what Caucasians were called back then, and they were the most evil, barbaric people upon the face of the earth back then. No one in history was as evil as the Caucasians in their nations. They slaughtered and butchered the Israelites. Look in chapter 32. This is, this is the next verse in the Christian identity doctrine, 32 and verse 8. Who are we still talking to? We're still talking to Israel. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, they're saying they are the sons of Adam through Abel. Is that dumb? Abel, the man that took Abel's place was Seth. Seth's descendant was Noah. His son was Shem. Shem held the office of Melchizedek, and Shem's descendant was Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. I'm sorry to tell you this, but the, do the Caucasians have an opportunity? Yes, they are the all flesh of the last days. We are the all flesh that God's going to pour out of his spirit in the last days, but this is the one flesh that he gave his spirit to, and Israel turned from God, and he said, now I'm going to extend my spirit to the all flesh, red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh. I'm not going to limit it to any particular race. That's the whole point. And then Joel 2.17, this is their next verse. Oh, did I read Deuteronomy 32.8? Yeah, okay. Joel, two, they, this is in their statement of beliefs. Is this one of the most idiotic things you ever heard in your life? They're taking God's word and saying all of this over here is talking about Caucasian. First of all, the Caucasus Mountains, the Caucasus Mountains is up here in this area right here. That's Assyria. That's ancient Assyria or the Scythians, the most barbaric people who ever existed. The Assyrians... The Caucasians invented scalping. They're the ones that would... The American Indian had to come across the Bering Strait in Alaska, either that or row across the, the Pacific, because he brought with him the old Assyrian torture system. It wasn't, it wasn't brown men or red men or yellow men or black men who invented this torture. It was the Caucasians. They're the ones that would tie a man down in the desert. We think this is American Indian. Stretch him out, stretch his body out, get a piece of wet rawhide, stretch it over his throat, and tag it down. And as it dried, he would strangle slowly. It was Caucasians that did that. It was Caucasians that invented scalping. That was not the American Indian. That was the Assyrians, the Caucasians of the ancient world. Bury a man up to his neck. It wasn't the American Indian when you see that in a movie. And he's buried up to his neck, and they would pour honey all over his head and then turn fire ants loose on him. Caucasians did that. Is that stupid to say this is a righteous race? Of all the races in the world, 
No one has ever been more evil than the Caucasians. For some reason, they're real proud and lifted up. They're the descendants of Japheth, the firstborn of Noah. Huh? Yeah, that's good. I think that's what's... <laughs> I thank God that he's given me an understanding of truth. Because if he turns us over to our nature and our natural mind, Adolf Hitler wasn't the guy that started this. He was the last Caucasian. He was the last Assyrian that slaughtered Israel. They've been slaughtering Israel for many, many generations, many thousands of years. Now, look over here in Joel 2. Here's their next verse, Joel 2. I'm just showing you how they perverted the Word of God. And probably not more than the Baptists and the Church of Christ and the Pentecostals and the Charismatics and the, and the Catholics. It's just another perversion. To me, theirs is more comical. Theirs is so obvious. When they walk in the door, you're going, oh, let me see, swastika on your armband, your head shaved, you... I wonder what he is. Got a machine gun in his, in his, over his right shoulder. Uh, and he's saying, Heil Hitler, uh, white power, white supremacy. Wonder what he is. Yeah. Joel 2. Look at Joel 2. This is a verse where they twist it. 17. Joel is talking about the judgment of God against Israel because they went after Baal in the grove. These books, these books were written to Israel. All of the Bible is written to Israel, either literal or spiritual in the New Testament. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar of what? The porch and the altar of a church? I think not. Of the temple. <coughs> and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thy inheritance to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Don't want these... Black people and red people ruling over us. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Don't let these people rule us. We're white. Is that? It's, it, uh, it's stupid is what it is. It's stupid is what. But the reason I'm giving this to you is so you'll understand where the Klan gets their doctrine. That's why they read their Bibles. That's why they burn crosses. They pick out verses, but guess what? The Baptists do that too that I was raised with. The ones that ordained me do that too. They pick out verses, they see, and they go, wrench. They wrench and rest the Word of God. Look at Isaiah 13. <coughs> Here's the next verse in their list of verses that they believe that has to do with white Anglo-Saxon. Who is Isaiah? I think he lived in the 8th century B.C. I think he was a... He was a contemporary of Hezekiah, the righteous, the righteous king of Judah, that they say Judah is evil. Man alive. He was, a, he, was a, he was a prophet in Judah. Look at Isaiah 13. Is this, does this sound crazy to y'all? It's insane is what it is. I've preached on all the Old Testament. Y'all have known this for years and years and preach prophecy. We know what this is about because I've preached on all of this stuff. Y'all know that. Isaiah 13 and verse 14. And it shall be as the chaste row, and as a sheep that no man taketh up, they shall every man turn to his own people and flee every one in his own land. And he's talking about the destruction that's going to come upon Israel one day they're saying that as a sheep that no man take, they shall everyone turn to his own people. This has nothing to do with turning to the white race. He's saying this is what they're going to do when God attacks them and starts to destroy them. They're going to turn to their own people. Let's read a little further. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through. This is talking about Israel being attacked being overthrown, we'll read it on down. And everyone that is joined into them shall fall by the sword. Their children also shall be dashed in pieces. Before their eyes their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them. Who is he talking about? Babylon coming and attacking Israel. <coughs> 
That's what this is about. And the Medes and Persians will come after Babylon after Babylon has ravished the women of Israel. This hasn't done any, anything to do with turn your own white people. This whole chapter is about Israel being attacked by Babylon, Babylon being overthrown by Persia, the Medes. That's really stupid. And then Genesis 1, go back to Genesis 1. This is their next verse. Genesis 1. Twenty five and twenty six. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind. And they're saying the beast is evil men. That's the lion, because look at the next sentence. And cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. The beast. If the beast is an evil man, why is it good? And God said, let us make man in our image. They're saying this is the white Anglo-Saxon. Is this dumb? This is Adam. And they're saying, Adam means red, therefore Adam must be the white Anglo-Saxon. This is in their doctrine. What do you mean Adam means red and it's white Anglo-Saxon? Why isn't it the American Indian who's red? Let us make white angle saxons in our image <laughs> after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. This is white angle saxon They're saying, and this is what they say, since most of the inventions were by white angle saxons and a lot of them were stolen from black men who made a lot of the inventions. And over the out of there in the earth since man has got dominion and since white Anglo-Saxons have done more to invent all these modern technology. Yeah, look at the trouble it's got us into. I think it was white Anglo-Saxons that invented the atomic bomb, the hydrogen drum, nuclear warheads. It was German Caucasians that did that. <sighs> Insane, isn't it? Romans 9, 21. This is their next verse. We don't have time to go into what they believe, but they of southern Judah. It's, how in the world they come up with this is stupid. The Jews of southern Judah was the product of Eve having a sexual affair with Satan, and that Israelites, which is northern Israel, was the ones he's talking about in 25 and 26, which uh, he made Anglo-Saxons. A man do to get him a twisted belief. He wants me to meet here in Waco, Texas. I mean, yeah. Jesus goes down and a million rounds of ammunition. Well, if he was Jesus, he didn't need a million rounds of ammunition. This is where the clan gets their doctrine. And in verse 21. To make one vessel unto honor and another to dishonor. Well, that's the white Anglo-Saxons made unto honor. Yeah. Everybody else is to dishonor. This is not talking about white Anglo-Saxons. This is talking about Jacob and Esau coming out of the same womb. And lump means dough that's to be made into bread. And we being many are one bread. And out of the womb of Rebekah comes two boys and they're twins. And one is made unto honor, and that's Jacob, and one is made to dishonor, and that's Esau. 
or the Gentiles. This has nothing to do with white Anglo-Saxon. And then here's the statement following this. Out of the CI, out of the Christian identity doctrine, race mixing is an abomination in the sight of Almighty God. You know what? If this wasn't so pitiful, it would be funny. In the sight of Almighty God, a satanic attempt meant to destroy the chosen seed line and is strictly forbidden by his commandments. Not race mixing. That's not what it's talking about. Now, let's get into some more of their doctrines, okay? And the first verse that they have in their statement of beliefs, in their statement of beliefs is Exodus 30. Is talking to. I think. <coughs> Exodus 34. How much time do I have? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the rest of this thing. This is a thing. They've taken the Word of God and made it mean whatever they want it to mean. They haven't kept anything in context, and it's always talking about either Israel or spiritual Israel or believers and not whether somebody is one race or another. When the Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, we're all one in Christ Jesus, it's talking about races don't enter into anything. Physical races enter into nothing. When it comes to the kingdom of God, I had a fellow said Do you, are you, the other day, he said, are you, you're not prejudiced. He said, I want to come visit you. I said, why? He said, I got this white man. He's got two black children that he's adopted. I said, bring them on. No, we're not prejudiced. We don't believe in that. We don't care what color your children are, if you adopt them or where they came from. We don't care if you, you're black and your wife's white or she's black and you're white. That ain't got nothing to do with anything. People who believe that are red what they are. Nick, yeah. Not according to the Bible. Moses was married to an Ethiopian, and they'll try to deny that Ethiopians, Athiops was one of the sons of Japheth, and Athiop, or excuse me, of Ham, and Athiops, or where we get the word Ethiopia, and Ham's descendants were black people, and they migrated, in, and the races were adjusted to the climates of the could survive there, not because there was a difference as far as God is concerned. Everybody as far as God is concerned is not good. Uh, what is, when you get to hell, if you're white, does that give you a better place in hell? I am Caucasian. I deserve to be above you in this pile of manure and flaming fire. Is Exodus 34 and verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. He's talking about Israel going in, and they go a whoring after their gods. He's talking about intermarrying with people who worship some God besides Jehovah. He's saying don't marry. If you're black and you're wife is white or vice versa, and you're both believers, you're the same race with God. But if you're black and your wife is black and you're a black man and you're going to marry a black, unbelieving black woman, that's intermixing. If you're white, if you're a white woman and you're, going, and you're a believer and you're going to marry an unbelieving white man, that's the intermixing that God says don't do. He's not concerned with what color your husband or your wife or what color your children are. We're all, first of all, we're all a bunch of cur dogs, aren't we? That's what we are, just a bunch of dogs. That Those of us that are circumcised. 
one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons. He's talking about don't intermarry truth with a lie. Because proselytes, God made provision for the proselytes, Gentiles, to come into Israel. You could intermarry with the Israelites no matter what your color was. That was the proselytes of the ancient world that Jesus told the Pharisees, you compass sin man to make one proselyte, and after he's made, you make him twofold more than the child of hell and yourselves. Because it's like Mr. Lightfoot says, he said they didn't want to win the proselytes for the sake of bringing them into the kingdom of God. They had more purses to fleece. That's why they were doing it. And thou take their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go whoring after their gods. He's talking about, why do you think he put going after their gods? Because he's saying, don't marry truth to a lie. He had made provision for the stranger in Israel. You could become, I think we talked about that this morning. You could become a Jew, become a member of the kingdom of God if you were a black Ethiopian, like in the 8th chapter of Acts, the Ethiopian eunuch. He came in and became a member of Israel. And make thy sons go whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. And that's what he's saying. <coughs> God is saying, I'm your God. Don't intermarry. The KKK got their doctrine out of the Old Testament. They just took it and went wrench, twisted. That's where they get it. The verse is where they get it from. Is this a, is, then let me give you the next verse in their list of doctrine of faith of the Christian identity. This is the dumbest stuff I ever heard in my life. The words are true. They make them mean something they don't mean. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. Here's the... the Bible means, but I don't know what churches know what they mean either. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 8. First Corinthians 10, and verse 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fail in one day three and twenty thousand. What's he talking about here? He's talking about Israel in verse Verse 1, moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant that all, that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. He's talking about Israel coming out of Egypt and all these people fell in the wilderness in unbelief. He's talking about Israel falling in the wilderness. Look at Revelation. Here's the next verse in their doctrine, Revelation 2.14. They take the Bible all over the place and pervert it and twist it into something that it is not revelation but i'm afraid that's what the whole world is doing today that's what all these denominations are doing revelation 2 this is to the seven churches in asia and these are gentile churches revelation 2 and verse 14 but i have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. I don't even know what their idea is putting this verse in here. Is. And it goes on and on. Let me, I'm going to just go ahead and give you the rest of these if I can real quick. Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7. In verse, verses 3 through 4, Deuteronomy is second law. It's being given to Israel, to original Israel, not to Caucasians. Deuteronomy 7. Now, they're going to come up and say, see, this is a promise to everyone. What they're saying, they're saying anyone who inherits the nations. Here's what gets me. Babylon's the mother of all idolatry. She was built upon, let us make us a name or self, and the most self-nation that's ever existed is America, the one we live in. How can it be Israel? Spiritually, is a Babylonian system. It's not Israel. 
If the Caucasians are anything in, a, in the world today, if the Caucasians are anything, the system of democracy and capitalism is appealing to the flesh. Do you realize that liberating Iraq from a dictator, and he was an evil man who murdered people every day, but now we're going to really teach them how to fulfill the flesh if they'll accept our form of democracy. We're going to show them how to sin and have everything they want. And, and I know when I make a statement like that, people say, what are you saying, Jim Brown? What's the answer? There is none. There's no answer. The Bible says that there will be Distress of nations with perplexity. Aporia is the word perplexity. A-P-O-R-I-A. A-P-O-R-I-A. It means in a quandary with no answer. That's what there's going to be at the end of time. There's going to be no answer. And did not the Lord say in the 36th chapter of Second Chronicles, he said, when I send in Nebuchadnezzar to destroy you, he said, there will be no remedy. There's not any remedy. Why are you preaching this, Jim? To warn believers, watch out what you hear so you're not led away. I'm not saying there's a cure. There's no cure for this. There's no cure for anything. America's headed down. You mean Israel's going to go to the bottom? This ain't Israel. This is Babylon. We're going to go down just as sure as I'm standing up here. If we don't go down, then the Bible's a lie. Man's going to get to wallow in his own lethargy and apathy and luxury and self and stuff and blood himself without the judgment of God? No. What did I tell you to go to? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 7. Yeah, Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4. 3 and 4. Talking about the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, back here in verse 1, seven nations greater and mightier than you when you go into the land of Canaan that was given to Abraham your father, when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, you smite them and throw them out of the land. Don't intermarry with them. They're all pagans. Verse 3, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me. That's what it's about. When you go into a land, don't intermarry with these people. That's what he's talking about, isn't he? That they may serve other gods, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. <coughs> but let's read 6 and 7. <coughs> Thou art a holy people, Caucasians. I like to throw that in there. Isn't that so dumb? What they're trying to say is, well, this was the promise to Israel over here. So it's given to the Caucasians over in the New Testament. That's not true. It's given to the spiritual Jew over here in the New Testament. It's not talking about Caucasians in the New Testament. He's not talking about he's going to give something spiritual to some skin. Is he? Verse 6, Thou art a holy people, Israel. Unto the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. You mean Caucasians? Whew. You know, this is disgusting is what it is. It's the word of God. The word of God's not disgusting. What they've done to it, I am repulsed by them. Huh? What they're implying a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And then he says those great words, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people. I think Caucasians are quite a large bunch of people across the face of the earth. Yeah, all the Russians, all the Americans, all the Germans, 
all the French, I mean, all the, all of the Scandinavian countries. That's a pretty large bunch of people across the world. Yeah, that's right. He said, he's not talking about Caucasians here for sure. He's talking about the Jews in the book of Deuteronomy. This is the second law before they cross the river. It's the last words of God before they cross the Jordan River to go possess the land. For ye were the fewest of all people. He's talking about a little bitty land that's smaller than the size of New Jersey. And that's... God delivered us from these idiots. I got, I got several letters from people that said they'd been converted from this. One fellow up north, he said, I was into this idiot doctrine. He said, thank God, God got me out of it. Look at Joshua 23. Joshua 23. I'm going to go through, a, I'm going to finish their doctrine here. This is the stupidest doctrine. It, the Bible is true, but their words are dumb the way they pull it out. I think Joshua was ahead of Israel as he's going through. What they're saying is the promises to old ancient Israel was given to the Caucasians in these last few hundred years. Where did they come up? First of all, where did they get that Caucasians are righteous in the flesh without bowing to the will of God? Where did they come up with that? Where did they come up with everybody in America that's white? Great place with God. First of all, if you were living, He'd kill you, destroy you, and send you to hell when you're an Israelite. They had no special place. Remember when they're in the wilderness and they murmured against God? The Israelites murmured against God. And because they murmured, because when he told them to go over across to the land of the Anakims, their first, one of their first uh, encampments, and they wouldn't go in, and they murmured against God and said, I wish we were back in Egypt where we had all these cucumbers and melons and leeks. And God said, for that, you've murmured against me, I'll kill everyone from 20 years old and upward. They didn't have any special inheritance with God. What makes you think Caucasians did? The only way a Caucasian is going to have any special place with God, the only way white people are going to have, is they're going to be, have to be circumcised of the heart, and that's going to be God doing it because they're elect. And it's not going to matter whether they're black or white. There ain't going to be any difference between a black man and a white man in the kingdom of God. None. Because all of our flesh is worthless. Joshua 23. Joshua 23, 12, and 13. <coughs> we'll leave 11, 12, 13. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God, Israel. Joshua is the head of Israel. Joshua is setting up the boundaries of Israel. Joshua is an Israelite, and, he, and Moses has died, and he's the leader now of Israel as they come across the land, and they're saying these promises are to the Caucasians in later centuries. Else, if you do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them, and they to you know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of those nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you if you marry them. This is where the clan comes up with their doctrine. He's talking about truth believers marrying a lie. And scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off the good land which the Lord your God has given you. Here's, let me just tell you this. The reason these people think, the reason they think that, uh, let me find me a pen, that's right. They look at literal Israel. They look at literal Israel, Israel, and they're saying that literal Israel has rejected Jesus. That's what they're saying. And they're saying, well, so since literal Israel has rejected Jesus, God's got to give this promise to somebody. Well, it is not Caucasians. It's not Caucasians. No, forget that. What it is, is to everyone who is circumcised of the heart.
heart. He's given this promise to spiritual Jews. That's the church. That's who gets this promise. has nothing to do with races. And you know what? When I'm standing up here preaching, how many times have I preached on Israel not intermarrying with these unbelievers? And then God said he'd scattered them. He said if you go in there, it's going to confuse your children. They're not going to be able to understand the languages. You remember the Nehemiah, the 13th chapter, how that Israel began to intermarry with, took wives of Ashdod, the Philistines, and took wives of Ammon, that's northern Jordan, and these were pagans in the ancient world, and, and they spoke half in the language of Ashdod and half in the language of Ammon, and the women stayed at home and taught the children, and not until Acts, the second chapter, was the word of God extended to the pagans so they had children that could not understand the word of God for, it, for their intermarriage. That was the whole purpose of it. It had nothing to do with the color of a man's skin. It had to do with the color of his mind, his brain, whether he was going after another God or not. And I've preached on this many, many times. But let me ask you this. How many preachers have you heard preach on this that understood it? I never heard anybody preach over my life and understood it. That's why nobody ever deals with this clan doctrine. They've actually had people go in and pull all these verses out about separating and about, and about being a separate people. And it's talking about God's people, Israel, and in modern times, not Caucasians. They've got the right idea. It's just that it ain't Caucasians. It's spiritual Israel, which is comprised of men of every nation, tongue, and tribe in Revelation, the seventh chapter. That's what it's talking about. It don't have anything to do with the color of skin, and nobody's dealing with the biblical understanding of this. I know of anybody that's dealing with it. And I've understood this. I've studied this all my life for 40-something years, and I've never heard a Baptist preacher preach it. I've been in hundreds of Baptist churches across America. I've been in hundreds of Assembly of God and Pentecostal churches, never heard any of them deal with it. They're not going to deal with it. That's when I was a young preacher. I don't go into them anymore. So the point is that they think, they know that the promise goes somewhere. They're saying it's to Caucasians because they got some stupid idea about when Jesus said, go not to the Gentiles, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they're coming up with some wild idea that Israel migrated to Great Britain and came to America. And do you know that they have to theorize that because it, a theory is something that does not have proof. They just got some theory on it. And it's a stupid theory at that. We need to understand where this doctrine comes from. Did I read Jer Joshua 23? Okay, I read that. Am I, I'm out of time, ain't I? Uh, I've got a few more verses to go through in this. I really want you to understand this. I don't know of anybody that understands God saying, don't intermarry with unbelief. And that, that doctrine started, the doctrine started at the flood when the sons of God, the descendants of Seth, the believers, married the daughters of men. The sons of God, the fifth, in the sixth chapter, the Bible says, the sons of God married the daughters of men. Sons of God are the descendants of Seth, the believers in the fifth chapter, marrying the daughters of men, the descendants of Cain. In the fourth chapter, it was truth marrying a lie. It was truth marrying unbelief. And that's where their doctrine started. Well, actually started in the garden. They took off with some of that goofy stuff about Adam and Eve and Satan and the serpent. But it, it goes, it, it, it starts back there. And it, what it's talking about is not intermarrying with the lie. And the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They'll be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. It doesn't mean they'll be intermarrying races. It means they'll be marrying truth to a lie at the end of time. And that's what's going on in the pulpits of America. You know why these guys are doing what they're doing? Why the Nazis and the KKK? Because it's, it's a deterioration of the truth in the pulpits of America. That's why this kind of stuff comes up. When you, once man gets involved in his own doctrine of let us make us a name, 
The Bible says man's imagination just goes haywire. Now nothing will be restrained from their doctrines which they've imagined. They come up with every kind of doctrine in the world. But this is one of the most twisting of doctrines I've ever seen is this white supremacist doctrine. I'm going to come back next week and try to finish their doctrine. They got a lot of stupid doctrines. Very stupid people when they believe this stuff. Maybe they did that to make their beliefs fit. That's what they're doing. Their beliefs fit with the Old Testament. Their beliefs fit twisted like with the Old Testament more than the Baptist and Church of Christ. The Church of Christ say the Old Testament's done away with, right? That's what they say. Huh? And they've twisted in the New Testament. The Baptists, and the Baptists don't study Old Testament. We're a New Testament church is what you always hear from them. They don't want to study New Testament. So they go back and pick up all these verses and say, we, we are the champions, you know, like queen. Well, no, they don't. But the Baptists don't study it either. And they don't believe it means what it says. Well, yeah, Pete, what, that's what gets me is Pete Peter's a church of Christ. He believes in water baptism for salvation, crackers and grape juice, repentance one time down an aisle. And what are the other two things they believe? Uh, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And they believe you have to take crackers and eat grape. Uh, eat. Right, every Sunday. Every Sunday. You got to do that every Sunday. Every Sunday. Night, night. Every Sunday. I Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a bunch of Baptists to me. Just, just crazy. I give the Baptist a hard time because I was raised down and I was ordained in it. And I just, when I was ready, you start seeing clear. You going, Phew. I'm going to continue this. At least if you don't have nothing else, you'll have notes on where this stuff comes from. And it's just nothing but a twisting of the Bible is what it is. And it's simply because the pulpits are twisted. That's what it is. We know what this means. I've preached on all this stuff without preaching on Anglo-Israelism. I've preached on Israel being separated, not intermarrying. You know what this leads to? With their intermarriage, it's talking, when Israel intermarried, they brought Baal in, and that's Christmas. Isn't that funny? It's talking about don't get involved with fire worship, which is Christ's mass. And I bet all these guys said, well, they may not. Most of them, Church of Christ, don't. But Pete Peters is the Church of Christ, and he's... Somebody said, well, you preach like him because he don't believe in Christmas and Easter. But all Church of Christ don't believe in Christmas and Easter. But they do it in their homes. They don't believe it in their churches. Put it like that. They do it. They go home and do it. Yeah. Nobody deals with it. The Baptists didn't deal with it I grew up with. They don't believe in... They don't even deal with anything. Everybody lets the Klan run rampant in the South, burning and killing and murdering. It's like Ron Collier out here. Ron Collier is a black man out here at prison. I used to go out to Riverbend. And Ron is just a really very bright, intelligent guy. He did a lot of musical stuff out there and studio stuff. And somehow he got stuff out there and doing mixing for sound, for music things and all. He was a very bright man black man just very articulate in his speech and he said Jim I came home one day and he said my mother was dead in the living room and it was KKK written all over my house he said where do people expect me to end up and and he was just Ron's a very very bright intelligent man but just what do you think happens to a young black man when he sees that happen to his family he just goes out of his mind. And if he wants to go out and kill white people, I mean, it's white America has oppressed. I'm not on some, some racist or some soapbox for civil rights. I'm just saying there's been a great oppression in this nation. And I, I, I'll just say this and quit. It's impossible to try an O.J. Simpson by a black jury in this nation until you go back and rectify all of this wrong that's been done. They're going to, what, what kind of, doesn't, that had nothing to do with whether O.J. Simpson was guilty or innocent. First of all, those were yuppies that were killed. Yeah. Yuppies is what oppresses black people. That's what rousts black men that's riding down in the car, street in a nice car on a Saturday night 
and he's just an honest man, and he gets, Larry will tell you, Larry Hill will tell you, he's been rousted. Everybody in here, our group that's, that's black men has been rousted by cops, by police, treated just mean, evil, just, there was a black man in, uh, he was a detective in Los Angeles, and he got a, they were trying to do a sting operations and on some cops out there, and uh, because they had so much corruption, and he drove off down in uh, the ghetto in a big fancy nice car, and he was busted constantly, and he was a detective. And he, and of course, they had a big shakeup in the police department there because they were, it didn't matter if you were driving a nice car, and they'd stop you and uh, beat you up, and take you out, and throw you on the ground, and because they were black, not because it was right. And until that, you say, what's the answer to this? There ain't no rights. There ain't no answer to civil rights. It's not going to happen. When you come to Grace and Truth Ministries, we're going to embrace everyone. Don't care what color the couples are. We're going to embrace everyone that believes God. And that's what we should do. They're my brothers and sisters. Larry's my son. Blue's my brother. Robert Link is my brother. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Thank you for helping to reveal these things to us that God, there's such an inequity in the world today. And we know the only answer is you're coming back. Thank you for truth. Thank you for revealing it to us so that we won't be fooled. Lord, we don't mean to say that everyone that's led away by some of these doctrines is an unbeliever. But Lord, thank you for revealing to us so we won't be led off. And may we help others not to be led away into these kinds of things. Lord, use us to glorify your name. Crush us under your hand. Forgive us of our sin. In Christ's name, amen. Isn't that amazing? Yeah.